Hello. Today we're going to talk about leadership and organizations, and we're going to review a number of leadership theories, uh, when they work, how they work, and uh, how they may not necessarily work uh, the way we expect. So, uh, as usual, let me share my uh, slides. Um, and um, the plan for the day, or for the session rather, is uh, we're going to talk about several groups of theories, the leadership trait theories, uh, behavioral leadership theories, situational leadership theories, and uh, we'll review very briefly contemporary theories of leadership. And um, that, that would really be that for the day. Um, in the most basic sense, uh, leadership theories can be grouped in uh, several camps, if you will. Uh, historically, the, the first theories of leadership have to do with so-called traits, distinctive characteristics of leadership that make specific leaders more or less effective. Uh, then we're going to talk about behavioral leadership theories, and uh, this has to do with leadership styles. And uh, I think we all have an idea what it could entail, you know, things like autocratic leadership or, or participative. So we're going to look into that uh, in detail. Uh, we're gonna look at situational leadership theories that primarily say that there is no one ideal leadership style and it really all depends on uh, on the circumstances. So, you know, like everything else in management, it all depends. And uh, then we're gonna look at those contemporary leadership theories, which uh, some of us may find appealing, some of us less so, but uh, at least we can cover that to see what, what current management scholars uh, consider when describing leadership. So first of all, uh, the leadership trait theory. Uh, it focuses on a set of characteristics or traits that supposedly distinguish leaders from followers or effective leaders from ineffective ones. And this is the earliest uh, set of theories that uh, people have looked at. Uh, some of that you know, that dates back to 19th or early 20th century is rather naive. So people were looking at things like appearance, right? You have to look a certain way to be an effective leader. And if you don't look the part, then regardless of, you know, who you are and what your characteristics are, you cannot be a leader. So obviously that uh, is no longer the case. And while we do may have some expectations for, you know, the way people dress up and carry themselves, uh, largely leadership has very little to do with the looks. Uh, we also looked at, or other scholars also looked at aggressiveness, self-reliance, persuasiveness, and dominance. And the idea was that the leader should be able to uh, command some presence and command obedience from the followers. So again, this is uh, not necessarily consistent with how we view leadership today, but uh, that's where this whole research into the effects uh, or effectiveness of leadership has started. And um, there was one study in particular that was kind of influential in propagating the traits uh, theory of leadership, the so-called Gazelle study, that was one of the first attempt to actually systematically collect the information and see what matters and what doesn't. So uh, that study has identified a number of characteristics or traits that are important to effective leadership. Not all of them are crucial, uh, but it's better to have them than not to have them, the study concluded. And uh, those traits are the supervisory ability, need for occupational achievement, right? So you remember we talked previously about need for achievement as being an important motivator for a lot of people. So apparently it matters for leadership as well. Uh, intelligence, obviously, decisiveness, self-assurance, and initiative. So as you can see, those traits, they kind of make sense, right? We look up to our leaders to display things like, uh, you know, intelligence and supervisory ability, decisiveness. Uh, we want our leaders to be certain, right? Self-assured uh, when they announce different strategic moves. So uh, that kind of stands, uh, despite our shifting of the focus away from trade theories, there's some, um, I guess face validity to, to these traits that we kind of accept. 
when we identify uh, what an effective leader is made out of. There was also a, um, a school of thought that looked at uh, moralized leadership, the ethical or unethical behavior, and we had a session earlier this semester where we looked at uh, ethics in business and why people may engage in unethical behaviors. So because leaders affect the lives of so many other people, obviously ethics is extremely important uh, to have in a leader. So uh, you want to pay attention to that as well. And um, there's no set of specific ethical markers that we want to see in a leader that is generally accepted. Um, there are different traits like integrity, personal security, sense of priority and vision that we would like our leaders to display. But again, that's, uh, that's pretty much open to interpretation. And um, I guess we all have an idea for what an ethical person uh, you know, would or would not do, what kind of ethical standards we are okay with. So um, that is essential. Apart from traits, uh, there is this uh, notion of behavioral leadership theories that basically suggest that it's not your traits as an individual, but it's rather how you behave as a leader that can make you more or less effective. So leadership style is this combination of traits, skills, and behaviors that managers use in interacting with employees. And uh, in the most basic sense, uh, we may talk about three leadership styles, autocratic, democratic, and lazy fair. So autocratic, obviously, you just tell others what to do and there's no discussion whatsoever. Democratic is when you rely on opinions of others, right? You solicit their participation, you um, maybe share your ideas with the people before you make and announce your decision. So that's that. And lazy fair, right? You've probably heard this term from your economics classes. This is when leaders do not really interfere with what's happening in the organization, right? You just give people free reign, you let them do whatever, and, um, you know, someone may ask if that's actually a leadership style at all or a lack of leadership. Uh, but again, in this Kurt Levin model, uh, this is one of the three styles and uh, you need to be aware of that. Um, there were also a um, group of studies, specifically two studies from the Ohio State University and the University of Michigan that tried making sense of leadership styles based on two dimensions. One is the amount of consideration for people that leaders have. The other one is sort of attention to the job itself, right? The structuring, uh, attention to what's, what's important uh, for the organization and not necessarily the individuals. And whenever you have two dimensions, you can build a simple two by two matrix that gives you four possible quadrants where people may find themselves with respect to their leadership style, right? So they may have high structure, high consideration for people, low structure and high consideration for people, low structure, low consideration, high structure, low consideration. So basically, you know, one of those four styles will probably encompass most of the leaders uh, that we can have. And um, building on those ideas, there's also this leadership greed that uh, describes concerns for both production and people that leaders might have, right? So it's all those four cells identified in the previous slide, but in addition to that, it adds this middle of the road management style. Right, so based on where your priorities are, you may be displaying impoverished management style when really your concerns for production and people are low, right, on both dimensions. You may have this authority compliance management style when you have high concern for production but low concern for people, and um, it doesn't really sound that attractive or that appealing, but there are many situations where this is the leadership style that uh, gets results. Um, country club management style is precisely the opposite. 
right? So concern for production is low, but concern for people is high. And, um, you know, that's probably the kind of working environment you want to be in prior to your retirement, right? It does not necessarily allow you to grow professionally, but the pressure is low, so it could be quite enjoyable. And uh, the best one, obviously, is the team management style, this high, high, the high concern for production and high concern for people. So that's the one you want to be in when you are younger, when you have room for growth, when you are interested in your personal and professional growth. So that's definitely something you want to consider. And so the only one that uh, this uh, leadership grid adds is the middle of the road management style. When leaders have medium concern for production and medium concern for people, you know, again, this is not necessarily something to look forward to if your professional development is the most important thing in your mind. But those are organizations where, you know, that would probably do just fine and uh, not exactly a high stress environment, uh, but the organizations would be managed rather professionally and probably would not go out of business as long as their strategies are, are decent. So those were the behavioral leadership uh, theories. And then there are situational leadership theories that basically say that there is no um, one best leadership style, that it all depends on the situation you find yourself in, the characteristics of your followers, characteristics of your environment. And um, the, the easiest one to see is uh, this contingency leadership model that tells you which of these two dimensions, task orientation or concern for production or concern for people, you want to emphasize. Right, so you start by looking at uh, the relationship between leaders and followers, whether they're good or poor. You look at the nature of the task, repetitive versus non-repetitive. And then you look at the leader's power. Right, so you remember we talked about power in organizations, power and authority. And based on how these uh, three factors are aligned, right, the relationships, uh, the nature of the tasks, and leader's power, uh, the appropriate style for situation should emphasize either the task, right, the production, or the relationship, the concern for people. So there's some evidence pointing to the effectiveness of this contingency leadership model. Again, the idea is that uh, there is no one ideal style and that you really need to take into account all of those things that render certain styles more or less uh, effective. Then there's this leadership continuum model. It takes into account the leader's, leader's preferred style, uh, the follower's preferred style, and the situation itself. So here we talk about seven possible leadership styles ranging from autocratic to participative, right? And autocratic leaders make a decision, announce it to the employees without much discussion and simply expect employees to follow. Uh, the second style is when leaders make decision and then sell the decision to the employees. There's not much questioning as such, but at least you try to get employees on board. You try to, to have them support the decision that you already made. Um, the third style is when you present ideas to your employees and invite their questions, you invite their input, so that they see that whatever decision you reach is based on how they feel and what they think. Um, style number four, a leader presents a tentative decision subject to change, obviously invites participation from the people, and this willingness to change is something that makes the style unique. So here employees start feeling that they actually have a lot of say into what's happening uh, inside the organization. Style number five is when the leader presents the problem, gets suggestion, and makes a decision, right? So at this point, there is no tentative decision made. The leader comes with an open mind, he solicits input from employees, and then makes a decision. Style number six, leader defines limits and asks employees to make a decision. 
right? So here the leader is, it's not exactly lazy fare as we talked about before, but the ultimate power is given to the employees. The only thing that the leader puts in place is just some limitations, like, you know, we may do this, but not that, or maybe our budget is this much, or, you know, maybe time constraints or, or things of that nature. And then finally, uh, the participative style is when a leader permits employees to make ongoing decision within defined limits. So here, employees do not even wait until the leader comes to them and asks for their input. They feel empowered to make decision on issues they face within those limits that, that the leader sort of promotes to them. So that's the leadership continuum model. There's also a path goal model uh, that basically says that uh, the situational factors such as characteristics of your subordinates and the environment determine the leadership style that you may want to adopt, which then affect your goal achievement and things like performance and satisfaction. So here we'll talk about four possible leadership styles, directive, supportive, participative, and achievement oriented. And I'm, Depending on how those uh, factors, environmental factors, external factors are aligned, um, one of those leadership styles will be most effective. Right? So I'm not going to read everything that's on the slide. Uh, I definitely suggest you go to the textbook and, and look into it. The whole point is that individuals, your followers, have preferences for specific leadership styles. And we are raised in this country to believe that everybody wants to be given a lot of freedom and that as a leader, you want to necessarily inspire people and delegate a lot of authority to them. Well, it's not necessarily the case. In many organizations, individual, individuals do not like to take initiative for the decisions uh, that have to be made. They actually prefer to be told what to do so that definitely reduces their cognitive mental overload. So, uh, you know, if you happen to be in a situation like that, if your employees have external locus of control, right, they, they just accept things happening to them, if they're not necessarily high ability, high skills employees, um, then by all means, you know, consider employing directive style of leadership. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? And there are also situations that support the participative style, achievement-oriented style, or supportive style of leadership. Again, the textbook talk, talks about it in more detail, and I encourage you to go there, uh, look into it closely. And um, the situational leadership model suggests that leadership style should match employee maturity level. Right? So we do not necessarily talk here about the age of the employee, Right, this maturity level, it could embrace things like uh, how long you've been with the organization, the psychological ownership you have with respect to what's happening. And uh, depending on this maturity level, um, leadership style, like at the lowest level, should be just talent. You simply tell the employees what to do, and that's that. It then goes to selling. So you have to sell your ideas to people. Um, you do not necessarily seek their input, but you try to get them on board. You try to get their support in, uh, in seeing the situation your way, if you will. It then goes to participating. So that at that point, you actually invite their participation, you invite their input, you try to incorporate it into whatever decisions you make. Uh, and then finally delegating, right? At this point, you let them make their own decisions and that's that, right? So there's probably some set of issues that you reserve for yourself, uh, but by and large, most decisions on routine issues could definitely be made by the employees and um, that's, that's that. Now, if you compare all of those models, it turns out that there's a lot that they share in common. Again, uh, I will not go through what's on this slide in detail, but you can see that there is a substantial overlap across those leadership styles that different models offer. 
And that actually gives us some hope, right? It's not that these models are incompatible. They just unpack this leadership styles and the effectiveness of leadership in slightly different ways. But uh, what it tells us is that for most situations, we can pick up a style that works. And um, that's, that's very important uh, for our success as leaders. Now, the problem with, I guess, most of those theories uh, for organizations is um, this assumption that as a leader, you can choose whatever style of leadership you're going to practice. And that you can switch easily between, you know, directive and participative style. And uh, that's an illusion. As individuals, we have our own preferred ways of interacting with others. And while we can try practice different leadership styles, uh, it's not necessarily something that comes to us naturally. We tend to fall back to our preferred leadership style, which means we're going to be more or less effective in different situations. And sometimes if you succeed as a leader with, uh, you know, less mature employees, when you direct them, when you simply tell them what to do, as they mature, your leadership style may fall out of preference, if you will, and you as a leader may have to be replaced with someone else who is more likely to invite participation from the followers. So in some ironic sense, if you are successful as a leader, you may have to be replaced which definitely has implications for your own career trajectory. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe rather than sticking with one organization for the long run, um, you become, you know, a person who share his or her experience with multiple organizations, right? By transitioning from one organization to the next, where your leadership style is particularly effective. So this is a thought that, uh, most of us are not comfortable with, but this is definitely something that you need to think through very carefully because again, uh, switching from one style of leadership to another is not something that comes to us necessarily um, naturally. And a lot of us may not be good at, uh, at doing that. And then finally, um, a word on contemporary leadership theories um, there's a lot that has been done lately. Uh, a lot of theories have been introduced. Uh, the leader member exchange theory says, you know, emphasizes the importance of positive relationship with each employee. So a lot of those theories are kind of, you know, touchy feely. And uh, those of you who are more into, uh, I guess, the, the, the hard side, side of sciences, uh, you know, like economics, uh, kind of preferences, may find this uh, too nebulous, too, too in concrete to uh, operate. Um, but, you know, uh, there's some evidence showing that uh, paying attention to the soft side of management is actually uh, very beneficial to organizations. So visionary leaders, uh, those are the ones that create a vision of the organization in the future that provides direction for certain goals and developing strategic plans. If you happen to have a leader who is a visionary, uh, then there's a lot of inspiration for the organization and people can get you know, carried away by that vision. So that may be a good thing. Charismatic leaders inspire loyalty, enthusiasm, and a high level of performance just through sheer strength of their personality. Right, there's something about them that uh, makes you want to be around them, want to sort of emulate them and uh, inspires you to do your best. Uh, so that's essential. Transformational leaders, uh, that's probably my favorite category. I think those are the people who bring about continuous learning, innovation and change, and they inspire you and they transform you. Personally, I, I, I'm somewhat skeptical 
uh, that this is something that you can develop in a person, right? As a person, you either have it or you don't. And uh, so, you know, if you find a leader who is a transformational leader, then definitely stick around, try to learn as much as you can, and try to learn as much about that leadership style as you can, because uh, that, is, that is absolutely fantastic. Transactional leaders, this idea is based on social exchange, right? You do this for me or for the organization, and I do that for you. So that's the leadership style that's probably easiest to understand. It's possibly, you know, this one is motivated by self-interest, which is why it is fairly easy to implement, right? So there are rules. Uh, you do this, these are your rewards, fair and square, easy to deal with, you know, no uncertainty of any kind. So um, definitely something to consider. That's definitely something you could emulate rather easily. There are servant leaders, right? They focus on helping others by placing their needs ahead of uh, self-interest. So in some way, it's the exact opposite of transactional leadership. And there are some organizations whose leaders are, are servant leaders and uh, they've been operating rather effectively. And then there's this notion of authentic leaders. Right, people, these people develop open, honest, trust and relationship. Again, this is the softer side of management. Um, in my opinion, you either have that or you don't. Um, so it may help you select leaders, right? Fit in leaders for the organization, but I do not see how you necessarily can turn a person who is not an authentic leader into an authentic leader. So, um, you know, again, it helps with selection, but does not help much with development. And uh, finally, there's this newer trend uh, towards uh, sort of doing away with leadership as such, right? So there's leadership substitute theories where people start building bossless organizations with self-leadership when they emphasize followership and, um, you know, sort of depending on the characteristics of the tasks, um, you know, when you have routine tasks and highly skilled people working, organization has a mechanistic structure where everything is well-defined, maybe you don't even need a leader, right? So um, some people in organization start redefining the way that uh, the leadership role in organization as such Right, so organizational design becomes very important. If you can structure the organization in a specific way, you can hire employees, right, well-qualified employees to, uh, to work for the organization, then who you have at the helm becomes much less important. And uh, that's roughly what I had to say about leadership and leadership theories. So again, this is not a substitute for reading a chapter, so please read your chapter. And uh, I'll be posting a video on the other chapter we're going to be doing later this week, uh, possibly later today, but most likely on Wednesday. So bear with me. Uh, and uh, I hope you guys are dealing fine with, with the crisis. And uh, I definitely hope uh, to see most of you next semester in person. So that's it, guys.